At three different Brooklyn addresses, gentrification makes its mark. The inside story of a bed building as outside, everything starts to shift. Five floors, 20 units, old timers, newcomers, have lived here anywhere from one year to 67 years. In Bushwick, tenants live with neglect and damage, weapons they say of a landlord eager to get them out. A group of renters, mostly immigrants, is fighting back. For seven years in Fort Greene, they fixed bikes here. But some customers took a different route. And the rent did what rents do. And it's because the property owners are able to charge an exorbitant amount of money that small businesses can afford. What happens when mom and pop shops get caught in the cycle? Why isn't this a story of the gentrifier being gentrified? So take a spin with us, and we'll show you how this neighborhood has changed. The Apple Store has landed, and it occupies the same building as a Whole Foods. What else is there to say about gentrification in Brooklyn? A few years ago, this space was a parking lot. Now, in addition to housing those retail giants, 300 Ashland is home to 379 residential rentals. 76 of those are affordable housing. From a lot to a lot including affordable housing. If this is the upside of gentrification, this has to be the downside. A 30,000 square foot former stable that opened as a roller rink in 1935 and eventually became the birthplace of Roller Disco, AKA the Empire Roller Skating Center. Empire was a first date spot, meets a community center and family fun zone all in one until the last skate in 2007, when the skating business was kicked out. They paved paradise and put in a storage facility, something U.S. Congressman Hakeem Jeffries labeled cultural gentrification at a rally to save empire a decade ago. Where there was once community is now a resting spot for so many sofas and side tables exiled from Manhattan. The second most popular definition of gentrification on UrbanDictionary.com is when a bunch of white people move to the ghetto and open up a bunch of cupcake shops. And even for them, the rent was too damn high. For years, it seemed like every day I was receiving mail addressed to former tenants. I couldn't help wonder about the people that lived here before me. I've only lived here for seven years, but this building is over 100 years old. I found it on Craigslist, moved in with a random roommate. He moved out a year later. I moved from a few blocks away, so I've been in bed for over 10 years. Five floors, 20 units, old timers, newcomers, have lived here anywhere from one year to 67 years. Several adults living here have actually grown up in the building. Rent stabilized, not much turnover lately, one apartment, one building, one very dynamic Bedford-Stuyvesant. When I came in bed it was very few blacks in bed at that time. When I was young, if you walked across the street or any block in bed and and black, the, the police would walk up to you and find out, where are you going? Now, I experienced that in my time. That's right, I'm 87 now. I was born in 1930. It changed quite a bit, and then it started changing fast. As black starts moving in, white starts shifting out. 
That's the way it was. That's the way we saw it. That's what I saw it. That's how the big changes start changing. Bedford Stuyvesant certainly has changed a great deal, and this building is no exception. It used to be called the Ivy Castle, and it consisted of 11 units and had an elevator in the building. In 1914, the Ivy Castle was sold. A few years later, the owner submitted requests for changes. That's when it was converted from 11 units to 21 units, and the elevator was removed. They found an old ad from 1935 looking for specifically white domestic help. Then it came across another classified ad from 1941 saying open to colored. I didn't intend to live in bed when I moved here over a decade ago. I was kind of scared of the neighborhood, mostly knowing its reputation from watching Do the Right Thing in high school. This was just the neighborhood where my friends found a great duplex that we could all afford right after college. But then I started interacting with my neighbors, store owners, started filming for a local business, and I became attached. I like pictures of other people, but not taking of me. Catherine didn't want to appear on camera, but she has a lifetime of bed stories to tell. I've lived here 58 years as of today. Moved in here December 6, 1959. I grew up in Brooklyn, so I, was, I, I came right from around the corner. I had to have a bedside person. When I moved in here, it was, was black. I don't think there was any white in here at all when I moved in. And it was a black landlord. It still is. Oh, I thought it was the most wonderful building. The, the, the bricks were still nice, not all chipped up and all the way it is now. You come into the lobby, that was another door, not, not that stuff they have down there now. It was a door. I don't know what he put that, that thing up there for. It doesn't do anything. And then on the wall, both sides was a mirror. And it had the chandeliers with the teardrop chandeliers. In the 70s, I lived in this community before. And in the mid-90s, I returned. <laughs> Actually, when I moved here, there was a lot of elderly people living in here who reside in here, like from most of their lives. I saw a lot of people leave out the here in body bags too. Hi Rebecca. It was April 8th, a very rainy day, but it was a very happy day. <laughs> there were some younger people here, but only a few. Over the last two or three years, it seems to me that younger people, people that are here, are thinking of this place as a long-term thing, like something where they actually want to be. I was supposed to be one of those short-term renters, starting with a one-month sublet. I was particularly curious about the people that inhabited my apartment before me and was able to connect to the former tenant that I replaced, but never met. So I, so I lived in this room. This room is a little smaller than I remembered it, but the ceilings are higher. They were like, we're sorry, but we did a lot of work on the place. Sorry, it has to go up to 1280. I was just like, what was it before? I guess you know. It was 201 in 1984. <laughs> so but it, it was, jumped it was... 500, I think, before you. You know, when Black stopped moving in, all the, there used to be A&P, it used to be a fish market, it used to be a meat market, disappeared. The things that was on the shelves before disappeared. Sometimes I'm amazed by how stereotypical gentrification is. Years back, I remember seeing vegan pastries at a store, and my thought was, too soon. Yet somehow, they're still around. I've always been comforted by living in a rent-stabilized building and knowing that my neighbors and myself have protection from the increasing costs of living in the neighborhood. But the sad and unfortunate reality is that luxury is not available to everyone. When the neighborhood gets masked in new stores and buildings, I wonder if we're trying to hide the problems that are still existing on the same streets. Poverty, crime, economic disparity. I, I actually learned how to discern fireworks from shots during those years. The pop, 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 or like, you know, the puff, puff, puff. When I did see a lot of police around here at that time, I was like, 
also realizing like, oh, that's for me. <laughs> you know, maybe that's an overstatement, but I realized that the dynamic was so that I could live in the neighborhood like this, basically. Neighborhood is different now. See, the, the, a lot of young white people have bought houses in the neighborhood now. Now, this is no talk. This is what I know from friends, my family. They would come to you in the hospital, offer you money to take your house, cash. That's how they did it. And that's what made it bad. That's how all these houses got bought up. I, I never wanted a house. All I wanted was one door. It's, it's normal that some people may get offended by seeing the gentrification or whatever, but I believe in the melting pot in which people all come together, combine, and live, share, and build. Yeah. I feel, I feel it should be a mixture, because a mixture makes better, if it's going to stay better. And so it goes. Our building, like so many others, in the trajectory of gentrification, has been sold. You have no obligation to talk to them. We don't know all the details yet, but some apartments have been offered buyouts. After learning about the offers, we decided to meet regularly as a group to share status updates and learn our rights. Fortunately, as a rent-stabilized building, we have legal protections to keep us at home, here. We formed a tenant association and are going through it together as one beautiful, complicated community. By the end of 10 years, the mayor aims to create or preserve 200,000 affordable housing units citywide. While a new lease in this building runs from nine to $1,500 a month, longtime residents fear their days may be numbered if a city-sanctioned redevelopment makes the neighborhood more desirable to those who fancy themselves urban pioneers. But what happens to the existing residents when a hood gets hot and the landlord favors new money over old tenants? Things could get ugly, and in Bushwick, they did. Then the tenants got organized. My name is Jenny Stevens Romero at Make the Road New York. I work on our housing team. We first found out about the building at, but from one of our members. She was already a member of Make the Road New York. She knew that the organization existed and that we helped tenants. The building is located at 175 Wyckoff Avenue in Bushwick. The landlord hadn't touched the building in probably more than 10 years, so it was in a really bad state of disrepair. Some of the tenants had big holes in their ceilings. There hadn't been hot water for a few months when we first went into the building and a lot of other pretty serious problems. We started working there initially in April 2017 and we filed our case in July 2017. Buenos días. Buenos días. Tengo una agenda que se puedes compartir con hasta que esto se arregle. Sí. Lo esencial sería el gas de la señora Ajá, y la, la calefacción. calefacción. 
las dos cosas en el edificio. Porque yo pago, son dos mil dólares. Uh -huh. No tengo en cuenta cuántos meses que más o menos nosotros. Sí. Ella tiene que arreglar todo. Mira la puerta, mira el pie de arriba mismo. Eso. Gas, techos de rosario y ventanas de Luis. Ok. Las dos de frente. Adentro los cables también están sueltos. Cables de luz. After a lot of discussion, um, the tenants all united and made a decision together to start a proceeding to take possession of the building away from the landlord and put it in the hands of an administrator. Iríamos a la corte, pero ella se pondría de acuerdo con una orden diciendo se tienen que arreglar estas cosas para tal fecha. Teníamos que ponernos fuertes uh -huh. nosotros, porque si no nos ponemos fuertes, ella siempre va a estarse burlando de nosotros. Uh -huh. ¿Por qué? Porque somos gente humilde, uh -huh. somos gente sencilla, somos gente de no problemas. Entonces ella abusa de nosotros. Ahí pasó el tiempo, nunca me arregló nada. Yo viviendo aquí tristemente con mi familia. Este es el tubo de mi calefacción. Está bien frío, bien helado. Así mismo está la habitación. Sin tener gas ni una estufa. Mi situación en verdad ha sido una situación bien crítica. Yo no tenía gas, no tenía mi estufa, no tenía agua caliente. Ay, que yo cocino, sí, con electricidad porque no tengo gas. Lo único que ella se ha preocupado es por cobrar su dinero y el resto que vivan como ratas. The other big thing is that the landlord had been harassing the tenants. Uh, when the tenants complained about the conditions, she would threaten that she was going to evict them, take them to court, call the police and call immigration on them. Um, all of the tenants are immigrants, so those threats were pretty serious and pretty scary to them. Le voy a llamar a migra, le voy a llamar a la policía. Cuando nos decían así, me daba miedo porque yo no sabía en verdad si era cierto que nos iban a echar para afuera. El día que ella vino a mi apartamento, la señora llegó, me golpeó la puerta, yo le abrí comedidamente como un caballero y la señora me dijo que le pagara la renta, que qué fue con la renta, altanera, como siempre ella, la señora es. Entonces yo le respondí que si me traía el agua caliente, yo le pagaba. Y ella me dijo que si no me gustara, que cogiera a mi hijo y me fuera porque si no me va a traer la policía. Entonces yo le dije, mire madre, no me falte el respeto, que yo no le estoy faltando el respeto. Si usted quiere traer la policía, tráigale la policía, pero conmigo hasta luego, buenas noches, y nos vemos en la corte, le dije. Sí, les interesa. We had lengthy discussions where we told them what their rights were in this building and that they had the power to do something about the conditions they were living in. Vamos a luchar este caso y ella no puede seguir con esas reparaciones que no son buenas, que realmente no son reparaciones. Podemos poner el dinero de la renta en una cuenta y que ella nos mandaría las cuentas o los, las facturas de los que están trabajando en el edificio y de la cuenta donde ustedes tienen la renta se pagarían esas facturas. Cuando aquí esté frío, el apartamento, yo no puedo estar, tengo que salir, porque no puedo resistir el frío. Bushwick is one of the places where I think gentrification is happening the fastest in maybe the whole country. So it really feels like this is an important place to be doing this kind of work. Un 80% ha cambiado el barrio. Antes esto era territorio de puro mexicano, ecuatoriano. Hoy en el día, este territorio es de blanquito, que viene otra gente de otro lado y les pagan $3,000, $2,500, hasta $4,000 dólares por un apartamento. Entonces ellos se ven, lo único que ellos quieren es sacarnos para meter a la otra gente. A lo menos en Nueva York, gracias a Dios, Tenemos leyes para todo. El que no tiene papeles, el que tiene papeles para indocumentados, documentados, para todo mundo. Quiero que esté claro que si entramos a un acuerdo, no es que ya terminó y ustedes ya no pueden hacer nada. Todavía se puede regresar a la corte si ella no cumple con el acuerdo. Buenas noches.
So what are you going to learn me today? Let's change this flat. Right. I'll show you the easy way to do really it. The easy way to do it. So seven years in, what was your anticipation when you came here versus the reality of what it was like starting to shop here at Murder Lab seven years ago? I anticipated slower change. Mm -hmm. It sort of skipped a step. The shop is very commuter oriented, very sort of blue collar, uh, working class sort of people. Into oh, fancier bikes. Yeah, absolutely. We are, you know, a little rough around the edges. And quickly, we weren't polished enough. Single family brownstones that changed the neighborhood. So yeah. that's one thing I didn't foresee. It's like hyper, skip the step, you know. So. Yeah. Why isn't this a story of the gentrifier being gentrified? And I'm not sure if I'm being gentrified. I mean, I've been in Brooklyn for 20 years, but I've, I don't live here. And I think like the, the classic definition of gentrification is, is you know, the locals, the, the people who have been there their whole lives are the ones being affected the most. Now it's no longer affordable because the city has changed, because the cycling culture has changed, and because, you know, there's a built-in increase in my lease, it's, it's no longer affordable. Now every year we've gotten every year. A, a raise, but it's been compounded. Right, so the seven year itch and you're out, it yeah. sucks. At first it did. Yeah. But I'm really proud of what we've done here. And I think that the connections that we've made, the relationships that we've built, are gonna stay here and are gonna continue to affect the people living in this neighborhood. It was a 10-year lease, I didn't make it to 10 years, but I don't think it, of it like that. This is the wave that I rode and it, it's coming to shore. This is the cycle, this is the end of what I can accomplish here. I moved to Brooklyn, New York, Fort Greene, um, a little under five years ago. Um, just like another, any other immigrant, I kind of wanted to find a space where I could feel comfortable and where the hospitality flowed. Red Lantern Bicycles and Cafe became that. The things that are very important to me, that of community and inclusivity and affordability, are really um, very much um, within the fabric of this establishment. You know, that just sort of radiates, you know, and I really like that, you know, folks from all walks of life and all ages and all different experiences kind of came and patronized the place and I was able to mix and mingle with them, you know? So if you're blessed with that kind of perspective to see your seven year arc, what could have kept you to 10 to fulfill that lease? Rent increase had definitely something to do with it. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of factors that I couldn't control. And so I'm not sure if there was anything that I could do. And so when we signed the lease, you could only buy books on Amazon. And you know, Amazon Prime now is, a, is a, hugely affects my business. Bags and seats and are all bought online. Yeah. And the core of the business now is necessities, is tires and locks and lights because things get stolen or, or things wear out. Or I couldn't predict city bike. Yeah. Corporatizing cycling happened. And that's something that I can't control. You know, 50,000 rides a day is what they average. I can't compete with that. Yeah, I thought that like, ship or what that rising tide yeah. is supposed to lift all the ships if more people are biking because of city bike mm -hmm. or more people are ordering stuff from amazon that just means we're creating more bikers mm -hmm. and keeping mom and pop businesses like yours afloat as well right but that never materialized well, i mean when you spend money on amazon it doesn't stay in fort green mm -hmm. when you spend money at a city bike location that money doesn't stay in brooklyn so there's this notion of hyper gentrification, yes. gentrification on steroids. Right. Uh, I just heard someone recently talk about this notion of cultural gentrification, hmm. where these places move in and land in a neighborhood. We lose culture along with commerce in right. a way. Nice. In your manifesto of the closing, you talked about the sort of inclusionary cycling culture. Sure. So what does the idea of cultural gentrification mean for the loss of a shop like this? The culture is created by the people that live in the neighborhood, by the small businesses that work here. That's how the neighborhood gets its flavor. And that's always been Brooklyn. You could walk five blocks into a different neighborhood and it would be completely different. Giuliani came in and cleaned everything up. Broken windows. Bloomberg started to incentivize these businesses 
and uh, try to attract more people. And I think that's where the switch happened. The control of the neighborhood went from small businesses and the local community to property owners. And the property owners affected that hypergentrification and skipped that step. Yeah. And it's because the property owners are able to charge an exorbitant amount of money that small businesses can't afford. And so you see Verizon, and you see Starbucks, and you see Chipotle. And these businesses don't care about the neighborhood. They just are attracting dollars away from small businesses. So if this was the Red Lantern story, mm -hmm. who would the bad guy be? Let's cast the villain. You want to blame the property owners, yeah. but in this you know, capitalistic society, it's supply and demand, and that's how it works. So it's easy to put, to be angry at somebody that you can see. Same why people were angry at me for gentrifying this neighborhood. When I wasn't doing the gentrification, it was the landlords doing the gentrification, charging $8,000 a month for a space, you know? I think that question should be asked to, to the city officials. Where do they stand? What are they doing to help? What do they plan on doing with all these empty storefronts, with the influx of, of corporate America into Brooklyn? You know? But it's so difficult being a small business owner, and it's hard and unpredictable and nerve-wracking. Realize the community that you live in and how special it is and what it takes to create that and to, to sustain that. Not everybody is made out of money, but try to spend your dollar in your community. Try to support your local businesses. There's no excuse not to do that. That's the one ask. Yeah. That's it. The neighborhood is constantly changing, but we'll always be here to tell the story of Brooklyn for Brooklynites. If you want to check this episode out again or any of the past episodes of Going In, find us on the web at youtube.com slash bricktv.